advanced energy. Thank you very much for coming out this afternoon to this terrific event. Thank you also to Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, CRESS, for officially co-hosting this event and for working so hard and diligently here in Washington on bipartisan, uh, pragmatic energy solutions. Finally, thanks also to our incredibly talented and hardworking staff for making today possible. It's a pleasure to welcome you for a timely and thought-provoking conversation on the risks facing our military and commercial grid infrastructure and the role that advanced energy technologies can play in addressing those risks. 2018 was a year that truly opened our eyes to the kaleidoscope of threats that may manifest in the coming years and decades when it comes to our electric grid. We heard, a wi uh, we heard of wide-ranging cyber intrusions into power sector critical infrastructure and witnessed the destruction that extreme winter storms, as well as hurricanes such as Florence and Michael, can wreak on civilian and military infrastructure alike. At the same time, however, Continued innovation in the United States offers new technologies, policies, and business models to create a more flexible, resilient power system for military and civilian grids alike. These opportunities to deploy advanced energy for bolstering U.S. national security are bipartisan. Indeed, it may be more appropriate to say nonpartisan. And they are, challenges, they are solutions to some of the most pressing challenges that our electric power system will face in the 21st century. It is with this in mind that we are grateful to have assembled such a compelling roster of speakers to discuss these issues here today. First, to my left, um, Kelly Ayot is, uh, you may know her as a former U.S. Senator from New Hampshire from 2011 to 2017. She currently serves as a Senior Advisor to Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. And she was ranked during her time in the Senate as one of the most bipartisan senators working across party lines to find solutions to our nation's biggest challenges. During her tenure in the Senate, she chaired the Armed Services Subcommittee on Readiness and the Commerce Subcommittee on Aviation Operations. She also served for a period on the Homeland Security Committee as well. She currently, finally, I should note, serves on a variety of different boards, many of which have, uh, are deeply involved in the energy sector, including Bloom Energy, a leading fuel cell solutions provider. Next to her is uh, Lucian Niemeyer. Uh, Lucian was appointed by the President as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and the Environment on August 2nd, 2017. Uh, as of yesterday, I believe, Lucian, is that right? Um, uh, in the process of a transition. Yep. Uh, transitioning from, uh, from that position to still working on, uh, on energy solutions for the Undersecretary. is Joe Bryan. Uh, Joe is a senior fellow uh, here in the Atlanta Council's Global Energy Center, previously served as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy uh, in the Obama administration, and before that had an accomplished career uh, on the Hill, serving in multiple different roles uh, uh, and working on energy issues throughout his career. Finally, to Joe's left is Nicole Bulgarino. Nicole is Executive Vice President and General Manager for Federal Solutions at Amoresco, uh, a leading energy solutions company. She is responsible for the overall management of Amoresco's dedicated business unit serving federal government customers, including U.S. military installations. With that, um, let's kick off the discussion. Uh, Senator, let me turn first to you. You wrote a very interesting piece just this week, actually, in the National Interest um, in which you, you noted a variety of different risks. You really did a great job of painting the landscape of risks and threats, but also opportunities facing America's electric grid. And you, you quote said, America must jump over regulatory, regulatory hurdles so that it can strengthen its electric grid for tomorrow's threats and challenges. 
Um, can you lay out to us just that landscape of what you see as, as some of the major issues uh, uh, facing the grid today and what sort of um, uh, jumping over regulatory hurdles you would, you would propose for the United States moving forward to deploy these solutions? Uh, I think Got it. <laughs> Uh, thanks, David. I want to thank the Atlantic Council, and I have to say I'm really honored to be here with this panel. And I got to see Lucian and Joe um, and their phenomenal work they did when they served as uh, for staff on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, so it's great to be here with, with them and Nicole as well today. So if you think about energy, why are we all here discussing it? And obviously to one current and another former uh, person who served at the uh, Department of Defense and also on the Armed Services Committee, me as well. Because we all know that energy is really about security. Um, this is a key piece of energy and energy security is very important to the country. Um, in fact, we talk about energy in the, in the con uh, context of domestic supply of energy and if, if you look at where we are right now, it's actually uh, 2017 was the lowest 19% um, of net imports of petroleum products since 1967. Um, but part of that is also that we are increasing our portfolio of the types of energy, including renewable energy, that we are expanding and using in this country. Uh, one of the things that, uh, as I look in my op-ed <coughs> talked about today, is that we think about uh, the threats that we're facing when it comes to energy security. It's not just domestic supply but it's really uh, the reliability and resiliency of our grid and its infrastructure. The infrastructure itself of the grid um, is the transmission and distribution lines were constructed in the 1950s and 1960s. And even if we look at the industrial control systems uh, and the computing systems uh, of the grid, they're from a generation ago and they were not built with security in mind. And often even with the aging systems, they're not even uh, that easy to update. And so this is one of the challenges that we face, and why is it important? Um, we all probably heard about the Russian, uh, essentially, intrusion into our grid and uh, hacking of our grid. In fact, the Home Department of Homeland Security this summer laid out more details about what happened. And of course, uh, Russia, when it came to Ukraine, actually, uh, shut down and caused a quarter of a million people not to have power in Ukraine. Now, thankfully, I hope we're a little bit better off than Ukraine, um, but it does show the power and the ability of, say, a nation state actor uh, like Russia or China to have a dramatic impact on us, our economy, our way of life, our health, our food safety. If you think about all the things that are tied in to the grid, and in fact, um, I cited it in the op-ed that, that Charles and I wrote, but the Council of Foreign Relations did a, a very good report on this in 2017 that really laid out what are the vulnerabilities from nation state actors of our grid. So where do advanced energy solutions come into this? It's really uh, critical that we deal with a couple of issues that we're facing, not just the threat of malicious disruption, but the threat from weather disruption. We've seen more and more of these types of events um, and obviously the impact, the effects of climate. And if we think about how do we ensure uh, that the American people have safe, reliable access to energy, we're going to have to make some investments in this resiliency issue. And I'm pleased to say that um, recently the Congress passed not only the DOD appropriations bill, but also the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill, which having done it this early, that doesn't happen too often in Washington. But within the Energy and Water Bill, there was $120 million set aside for the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response within DOE, a relatively new office established within DOE, focusing really on this resiliency issue and how do we ensure uh, that the grid is uh, more reliable and more protected against disruptions, whether natural or malicious. Um, I think other ways that we're going to look at solving this is I'm a big fan of ARPA-E and DARPA funding because there's some research, for example, on issues like storage, which could, which could make a big difference um, when it comes to resiliency and reliability of the grid. 
that isn't all going to get done uh, within the private sector because the economic incentives aren't always directly there to get some of this research done. Uh, finally, uh, he mentioned regulatory hurdles. I mean, if you look at some of the regulatory frameworks, it's really not set up for new technologies. And so one of the things we have to do is review the regulatory frameworks that are in place, not just for citing uh, new pro energy projects, but also as we think of new innovations coming to market. Um, if you are lose using old rules to deal with new technology, does it apply and what needs to be updated to make sure that we can get new technologies that are created in the private sector or with some government funding to market as quickly as possible. I know that uh, Lucian and Joe are going to talk to the DOD piece, um, but it's a, such an important piece, the largest consumer um, of energy within our, our government. Um, they're doing some very important pieces that I know Lucian will speak to on uh, distributive generation. And we do have vulnerabilities when it comes to our military because um, even whether it's a weather vulnerability uh, like we just saw um, at the Air Force Base in Florida or whether it is obviously those that want to do us harm um, in striking at our military facilities when it comes to the energy infrastructure. So I will leave that piece to Lucian, but I'm really glad to be part of this discussion and look forward to uh, talking with my co-panelists and answering your questions. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Lucian, uh, Senator Ayo laid it out. Uh, DOD is the, the you know, a, a uh, how to provide uh, resilient grid solutions. Um, walk us through, uh, you know, Secretary Mattis has, has really been a leader on this. Um, what is the Department of Defense doing? How do you frame this, uh, this whole paradigm of grid resilience when there are multiple different types of threats? Uh, and, and what are the solutions that you're deploying right now? Well, I appreciate it. First of all, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to, to the group today. Um, this is an outstanding subject and it's something very timely for us and it's something we're thinking about every day. So I want to thank you, David, for holding this panel. And, and, and Senator Ayad uh, was a little bit, uh, um, I actually had the opportunity to serve for her, actually work for her as a readiness staffer uh, for three years. It was an honor to work uh, on the issues that are uh, important to the committee and uh, working for you for those years on the Thanks. committee. So, um, so I've been in the job for about 15 months and I actually started off with an observation about where we're going with society. And I'll have to, if you don't mind, I'll give you like 30 seconds of a personal story. Um, so I have a 17-year-old son, um, bigger than me, strapping, uh, nothing can hurt him. He's a uh, lacrosse, varsity lacrosse goalie. So as you know, uh, they get, you know, they basically are responsible for stopping 100 mile an hour balls. So nothing can hurt him. Nothing can phase him. He's about the most steady kid. But when he loses his uh, uh, charge cord to his iPhone, <laughs> he goes into the fetal position and he's in inconsolable. So what, I, so what I'm going, where I'm getting at is that it's amazing um, how much this society has come to rely on reliable power and the need for constant power to stay connected, um, to stay uh, engaged, and in some cases to stay alive. And we in the Department of Defense are keenly aware that not just the society, but the Department of Defense needs that access to reliable power. And, in, and as it's need, it's also a vulnerability. Uh, Secretary of Defense released a National Defense Strategy early this year, uh, in 2018, and for anybody who wants to see where we're going with power needs to read that National Defense Strategy. There's a couple of key elements in here that have guided the efforts of uh, my staff, and I also want to introduce uh, my Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense, Lisa Jung, who's in the audience right here, guided us on where we need to go with energy innovation in the future. If you look at the National Defense Strategies, two things that stand out. First of all is an acknowledgement that the home longer, homeland is no longer sanctuary, and that we expect that any type in the, in, the, in the future, an adversary will attempt to disrupt our ability to conduct missions through uh, either a, a, a attacking or damaging our commercial power grid. And we must be prepared for that. The second item is that if you look across all the emerging technologies, and I'll use, a, I'll use technologies in another way, not necessarily the technologies to uh, protect our grid, but look at the technologies we're going to need to protect our nation. If you start seeing what's listed in the National Defense Strategy, it starts talking about uh, directed energy programs, robotics, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, uh, artificial intelligence, artifi um, uh, ele electronic warfare. It is all based on electricity. Look at where we, we're going with the changing character of war. The future war fighter is going to need more power at home station to train with and ultimately to be able to take with them to the battlefield. 
And that's driving significantly the change we're, and innovation in the technology we're seeing with the Department of Defense. Across the board, we're going to need more power. So it's not just protecting what we have, it's, but it's ensuring that as we move forward with these technologies, we need to defend our nation. We need more power. And so that's why we've spent a lot of time in the last 15 months since I've been on board realigning the priorities of the Department of Defense. If you go back over the last few years, we've definitely been investing in distributed generation um, using whatever power agreements we have, whatever vehicles we have to allow uh, the private sector to work with us on building uh, uh, generation, distributed generation in the country. That's a good news. That's very good news. It's allowed us to become more resilient. The problem we have is for the overwhelming majority of those projects, they cannot provide power to the mi critical missions we have on our bases because they tie into the grid. They do not tie back to the, to the base. So we've had to make some significant changes in the last 15 months on uh, moving from about 10 years of concentrating on, on building generation to now what do we need to do to connect that generation to our critical missions. So we're working with the military departments. We are uh, working on projects now. We've seen an increase in funding uh, supported by Congress for us to get to what we call energy resilience. Uh, and, and along with environmental resilience, physical resilience, but we are really working on energy security, energy resilience. And therefore, we're looking at technologies just like everybody else is. Where, what is the next best storage mechanism? Where is that smart grid? But the goal is we're not necessarily chasing the dollar where, where, where there, we might have a deal. We're chasing where we need to have a critical uh, capability that needs reliable power. So we're focusing a lot of our efforts on where do we have our critical assets around the country, and in some cases uh, outside our country, where we must have 100% assured power. And we're coming up with individual solutions on how we can provide redundant backup or at least uh, a more reliable power. Uh, we're also looking at technologies uh, uh, such as uh, uh, advanced nuclear reactors, where we believe that micro reactors do offer us a capability. It's not the panacea, it's not the end state, um, but in certain situations where we have a strategic asset that has a vulnerability right now with a single line, we do need some type of, of more protected, and in, in some cases, power that we can actually own and operate. So we're pursuing a full range of initiatives uh, full range of technologies with the goal of meeting the, the, the imperative of the national defense strategy that ultimately the, the, the uh, warfighter of the future is going to need more power at home, dedicated power at home, and then dedicated power on the battlefield. I'll go ahead and leave it right there and then throw it up for questions. Terrific. Thank you very much, Lucian. Uh, th that's excellent. Your, you know, your longtime colleague, Joe Bryan, sitting next to you has is, is, is seen this you much like... You know how Lucian didn't say it was an honor to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> he shares Joe, that view with a lot of other people, though. My so nose would grow. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to fact check that. That's right. Um, Joe, you, you, like Lucian, have, have seen this from the, you know, from the military side of things as well as, you know, uh, on the Hill. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a, let's say, a, a battle or a healthy debate that's going on in the United States right now about how to frame the connection between grid resilience, national security, and how we spend, uh, the, you know, on infrastructure as well as the policy mechanisms we deploy that shape markets and that shape outcomes. Is that debate or is that conversation uh, being framed the right way, or how do you propose it should be framed? It's a good question, David. Um, you know, first, let me uh, thank you for putting this together, for the Atlantic Council to put this together. You know, it's a, it's a bit intimidating to sit up here on this, on this panel, uh, not just for the obvious reason that everyone's smarter than I am, but also because as a kid from, who went to uh, uh, the Patriot League's finest uh, Fordham University. I'm sitting up here with all the power conferences. <laughs> it's middle of football season. I know Senator Ayotte's a Penn Stater and, and, and Nicole's uh, from SEC, uh, Tennessee. And, and Lucian, while it's not a power conference, Notre Dame is a conference of one. Go Irish. And so, but, but I don't want to see too much ground because little known fact, uh, except for those of you who are diehard football fans, is Fordham did win a national championship, at least part of one. Granted, it was in 1929. But we are, we are on our way up. Uh, we're, um, and this is my segue. We are a resilient bunch uh, at the Rams. So uh, you're right, David, that there's been a, uh, just a lot of talk over the past year about grid resiliency, grid security, uh, and what, wide, what a widespread grid outage could mean for our economy, for our critical infrastructure, and for our defense installations and, and the critical national security missions that they support. Right? So there's been a lot of talk. Um, 
Unfortunately, I think we've focused too much on um, a relatively small number of power plants, mostly in the Midwest, uh, that are uneconomic and are, having, uh, are struggling to compete. And um, I think in focusing on that part of the, part of the issue, we're, we're really missing an opportunity, and I worry that we're missing an opportunity, because the problems we face are, are real, right? The threats of, of uh, cyber attacks on our, on our grid are real. Uh, the, the March issuance by DHS and FBI, uh, the warning that the Russians had intruded into our, our we're targeting our electric grid and our, and our nuclear power sector. That's real. Our weather events. I mean, look, we have Michael, Florence, uh, Maria. We have uh, wildfires that have touched Camp Pendleton out west and even in the past week. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and both, and Southern California, and as a matter of fact, have both talked about curtailing power in the face of wildfire. So we face real threats to the grid, right? Um, and we need, to, we need to figure that out. Um, but the vulnerabilities are really, as the Department of Energy would say, are on our transmission distribution systems, right? Almost all the outages in the commercial grid are related to transmission distribution of energy. And our military bases, Lucian's fighting every day for resources to make sure that we can, we can take care of our bases. Our bases are a long neglected part of the defense infrastructure. And the majority of outages on our bases are, 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 the, are the root cause. Is the root the root cause of that is our own infrastructure, right? Underinvestment in the things on our bases that allow us to work. So that's where we ought to focus our time and attention and our resources and our political capital, frankly. The other thing we're missing is an opportunity to talk about what we can do about it. So. Uh, Senator Ayotte mentioned, uh, uh, or, or David, I think, mentioned that Senator Ayotte's associated with the fuel cell company. Small, modular, distributed sources of power that you can put close to the load that can create, in some cases, even fuel diversity and allow you to improve your resiliency. Lucian's fighting every day for plus-ups in the budget for uh, resiliency projects at DOD, and I think you got, what, another $30 million? $43, or something? $43 million this year for that. Not enough. It should be $433 million, right? Um, and, vote? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my vote. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have much of a say in that. Um, and the new technologies that are coming our way, these are not science projects anymore. These are commercial technologies that are available to the Department of Defense and to commercial actors in, 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 out in the economy to help make them more resilient and help make the power flow even when the grid goes down. I think what I'm excited to hear from, from Nicole, we have some really interesting projects in the Department of Defense. We have a microgrid out at Miramar. That's do, they're doing some great things out there. We have some... Really, uh, Lucian can run through a list of projects we have. And, and I hope Nicole goes into some depth about uh, the project that uh, Amoresco has down at Paris Island. Because they have battery storage, solar energy, combined heat and power, energy efficiency bundled together with a business case that makes it work for her company and a performance case that helps the Department of Defense, the facility down there, the, the Paris Island, be more resilient and stay up even when the grid goes down, keep the mission up. So I hope that's the discussion we can have, because I think that's where we need to go, and that's where we can make a lot of progress. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, Nicole, turning over to you, Joe teed it up really well. Uh, Amoresco is an energy services provider that is you know, very much involved in, in doing what, what there's, you know, we need in our civilian grid, but doing it and, and, and actually showing true results at military bases around the United States. Basically ensuring that as we get this, this uh, panoply of different um, distributed energy resources, new technologies on the supply side, on the demand side, et cetera, that those are working together as a symphony rather than as a cacophony. Um, walk us through with an example of something like Paris Island in South Carolina, how you're doing that and how you're ensuring that these new solutions are working together as a symphony. Sure, and, and thank you again for having me on this panel. It's, I feel very honored to be with you, Senator and Lucian and Joe, and appreciate all the advocacy you've done on really trying to drive to a solution for energy security and realizing the importance of it. But along with the importance of it, it's, it's also a very exciting time because, as you mentioned, the advancement in technology and innovation right now in the energy space is what I think will help us get to what we need to do to find these energy security solutions. Uh, we just are close to wrapping up construction on a great project, a great example of resiliency project that we're doing at the uh, Marine Corps, um, their depot in Paris Island, South Carolina, which I'm sure most of you are familiar just a couple months ago or maybe a month ago or under the threat of uh, Lawrence. So at that, pro at that site, we were able to, in uh, public partner, a public-private partnership, 
come together and find a solution that not only brought security, but also first addressed energy efficiency, which is a big component of energy security, because the more you can reduce the demand of a, prod of a facility, the less you have to secure. So using that and then putting in a combination of natural resources like solar there, and then also putting in a new cogeneration facility, which also replaced a much needed, probably 100 year old boiler there um, that they were just you know, praying every winter would work. Uh, we were able to do all new infrastructure for them, but then also integrate it with a nice battery storage system, um, a nice comprehensive battery storage system and microgrid, so that if for some reason they lose utility feeder power, they can simply seamlessly trans, um, transfer to this cogeneration facility or the solar and it's just nobody would even know the difference if you're on the site. So that is very important there. Um, their mission there is to train as many uh, soldiers as they can through that base and so you know not having any, any interruptions in their training facilities is very important to that base. And that project has been going on, we've been in construction for about two years and so we will be commissioning this microgrid system in the next few months. Um, the, the panels definitely, the, the panels survived the hurricane, so that was good. Um, so that was the first test of resiliency right there. We made sure they were designed for that. Um, so it'll be exciting to see as we go in there. And this is just one of many projects that the Department of Defense and other federal agencies are, are doing using uh, private money to fund resiliency. That's terrific. Um, it, you laid out a very successful model, and obviously, obviously, Amoresca has been extremely successful to you know to date in working with our military bases and working with DoD to provide these solutions. But as as many of you know, um, the the government contracting process can be notoriously long and and laborsome and time consuming and and at times inefficient. Um, this is particularly of concern when there is a potential mismatch or asymmetry between the length of that process and the sorts of companies that can endure long sales cycles and the risks involved with government contracting, and yet the fact that many of the most innovative solutions and technologies are coming out of smaller companies um, that are not well suited uh, to these long sales cycles, to this sort of market risk uh, involved in government contracting. Really a question to all of you, what do we need to do to fix that asymmetry and to make sure that we're not missing out on the most cutting edge technologies because of the way that we do government procurement today. I think this is probably a, a great question for Lucian in particular, uh, but I will say that what you just described, David, if the innovation that is happening um, in companies, for example, the company I serve on, Bloom Energy, uh, you don't need the grid. It's, it's a fuel cell. Uh, box that you can basically bring anywhere. You can hook up to natural gas. We're going to have some projects hooking up to biogas. So it can be a backup or it can be on its own with the grid as a backup. And so, I mean, we, we have to envision a future where, yes, we're going to protect our grid more. Um, that's important because we'll still need a grid. But we're also a future where we do not just on DOD sites, but in other critical areas, whether it's data centers or hospitals that we're going to have, whether it's a microgrid um, or whether it's going to be a fuel cell or some other type of technology. And a lot of that innovation doesn't happen in the largest companies. In fact, it happens with, you know, a brilliant person who has an idea, like our founder, K.R. Shridnar, who just had an idea, was at a university and started a company. And so the idea of being able to maneuver the DOD acquisition process for a smaller player is very, very challenging yet a lot of the innovation may happen with smaller players. So um, I'm going to let Lucian, who really can talk to the expertise on this, but in some contexts in DOD, we've had to have a rapid acquisition project, not for these types, for, but for smaller equipment needs that our troops have in the, immediately in the field. And in some ways, I think we have to have sort of a better, more efficient process for these, these important energy type projects when innovations come along so that the the government's not the last adopter um, when we should perhaps be, in some of these instances, one of the first adopters when it comes to security. So you're, you're asking a question which has been the, one of the fundamental things we've been working on in the Department of Defense in the last two years. Uh, there's no doubt that the Secretary shares the frustration that we're not going fast enough. It takes us forever to acquire uh, any type of product or a weapon system. Uh, it takes us far too long. We have been working with Congress, and Congress has responded in a positive way uh, with giving us new authorities, rapid acquisition authorities, that allows us to take a technology that we know will 
change the game and actually figure out a way to get it out to the to the f uh, field as quickly as possible. I'd say that the door is open. You're, you, um, the, the, the contracting process I hear the most about are the long-term uh, contracts, the, the power purchase agreements, the ESPCs, the USCs, and yeah, there's no doubt they and some of them take three, four, five years, and we, we are working today on how do we go ahead and get that down to about, a, at the most, a two-year process. Uh, we also have what we call other, tracks that, other transactional authorities that were provided to us by Congress. That gives us a, a really good basis for seeing how, more, how quickly can we bring technologies to bear. Uh, we're looking at that potentially, um, looking at radical ways to procure energy as a service. Um, taking advantage of some of the models that are out there, I think, uh, in, in this country. Ohio State University did a fantastic job. No, it's another Big Ten, sorry about that. But, uh, but they did a fantastic job on procuring a long-term deal, energy as a service, which we are, we, we're interested in. We're trying to see maybe how can we apply that <clears throat> collaboration of authorities within DOD to enter to a long-term deal for the reliability that we need. And that, uh, if you all know that deal, um, the company that got the, uh, the contract was able to turn over to Ohio State on day one a billion dollar check uh, for investments um, that the, Ohio, the, the university determined to be appropriate. Not sure we want to take a billion dollar check from anybody in DOD, other than from Congress. <laughs> um, but I do believe that it does, um, coming up with innovative ways to do that kind of contracting does open us up for the types of investments we need to go what I said earlier, to get to that last microgrid, to get to that last connection that allows us to be able to provide reliable power for our critical functions. So I'd say um, don't be dismayed. Uh, we also have uh, you know, rd &E funds available to us. I'm sorry if I'm using acronyms. I'm so used to that in the Department of Defense. Research, Development, Test, and Evaluation uh, uh, funds um, that allows us to go out and actually work with small businesses on what are the cutting edge technologies that are out there. That, that fund is still alive and well. And uh, we, we are right now even working on our FY19 proposals that are geared right around energy st uh, battery storage and energy storage. So we know that's still a critical need for the warfighter. So I wouldn't say that it's broken. Yes, it's frustrating at times, but I do believe working with Congress, we're starting to be able to have a little bit wider range of authorities to allow us to be able to get to that rapid, rapid process we'd like to get to. I'll take a, a, I'll just add to what Lucian said real quickly. I think other transactional authority, first of all, let me say, I, I have the opportunity to work with some small companies now commercial technologies, but small companies don't have the resources and the time to engage the department in a long, and the government at all in, a, in the long sales cycle. It's just, it's brutal and it's expensive, right? And, and, and that's not what they, that's not how they want to spend their time. Um, I will say the department has put a couple things in place and Congress has put a couple things in place. The uh, other transactional authority is a really interesting model to get things to market quickly and allow, and frankly, one of the advantages of it is it allows the, the customer at the Department of Defense or one of the military services to talk to the providers so you can work together on a solution outside of some of the constraints that, that uh, traditional acquisition places on, on folks. So there's, there's some interesting models and, and to their credit, they're, they're testing a lot of this stuff out. Uh, I haven't seen it as much on the installation side, on the military installation side for operational platforms. I think it's, it's more prevalent. I haven't really seen it. Um, I'd like to hear Nicole talk about this, but one of the challenges we have in the department is even for commercial technologies, if you have the best widget in the world that's gonna save storage or, um, or um, uh, an efficiency project or efficiency product, we don't buy uh, products all the time in that way. Lots of times we, we contract with, a, with an energy services company who comes in with a portfolio of technologies and a business case that allows it to work for us. These are $100 million projects. So if you're a small company, that has a really great product. Um, a lot of times, access to the defense market is through, through energy services companies and, and companies like that. The challenge, of course, for companies like Nicole's is, is how do you figure out how to balance the risk for a company to take on maybe a new technology, even if it's great. A company that's been around for five years, you're taking on uh, Nicole's company's taking on a 20-year contract. How do we? balance the risk? How do we as the government say, we'll take part of that risk and you take part of it because we both want, you want to bring that into the government and we want to have it. Uh, and so we have to kind of figure out some things like that to really make uh, kind of the next generation of progress. Nicole, do you want to comment on that and how Amoresco balances those, sure. those things that Joe is outlining? I mean, one of the first comments I thought, I mean, definitely matching these small commercial or new products with companies that have been doing this for a long time would be what I would definitely recommend for these smaller companies. I mean, we are all constantly looking for the next, whether it's a battery or whatever the technology may be. Um, I know the government does good jobs of hosting inter industry days where they can bring both 
sides of the table together from the constructor to the manufacturer. So that's one way and just branding their products out there because we're definitely seeking them. As far as balancing risk, I mean, it really depends on the project itself, but we, you know, being an energy solutions provider, we're, we're aligned to try to take some of that risk because we need to see if this is going to work to be able to keep up in our space and be competitive. A lot of times we've done things like working on in special um, federal programs. They have grant programs where we can do pilots. Um, we did a, a project up at the Portsmouth Naval Station where we were able to put in a battery, a smaller battery microgrid under a grant program where there's not a 20 year risk. It's more just like construct, do, see it work, and we both are working together to, to make it successful. Um, that's one possibility. Or doing a, just a smaller project first, getting some success built up, and then adding on to that contract. So those are just a couple examples of what you could consider doing. Terrific. Um, there's been a, a lot of discussion in Washington, both from the administration and on, and on Capitol Hill, about infrastructure spending and about the potential for an infrastructure bill or a series of different infrastructure bills coming down, down the pike in the next uh, you know, several months or perhaps the next year. Um, we're, we're pleased, very pleased to have this event being being uh, uh, broadcast live on on C-SPAN right now. So for for all the congressional staffers watch who might be watching this and who might be thinking about that infrastructure bill, this is an opportunity to to say beyond just additional funding, what are the things that we should be thinking about including that will help advance energy resilience as we invest in infrastructure as we invest in the in power sector infrastructure. All right, I have to be careful here because I don't want to advocate for uh, future funding for the department for for the federal government. I can do that. <laughs> I, I think we already are. We have a, a lot of support from Congress already, uh, and to say we need more, you know, you know, we are in a resource constrained environment. We do know that uh, we have to be careful what we're looking at right now for deficits and debts. Um, but given the the funding we've been given to date, I think there's a lot we can do. Uh, there is a lot of work we're doing in the Department of Energy right now. Um, great collaboration with the Department of Energy on seeing, okay, where can we take um, the grid? Because it is, it is ultimately, uh, the, it, is, it is the transmission distribution system that worries us the most. Um, but, and, and, and figuring out how we can robust that up as certain key nodes to be able to continue to power some of our more critical assets. Um, been spending a lot of time with DOE on seeing where, where we have more reliable sources, uh, mainly dealing with uh, hydro hydrological sources where how can we then make sure we immediately can do use that for a black start as well as uh, funding critical, absolutely critical functions around the country from those plants. Um, so I'd say um, probably we have enough we need right now. Um, I'd want to work within the administration and see if we need anything more. Uh, we also have new authorities right now. We were just given authority by Congress to allow us, if we feel it's a national security imperative, to be able to take DOD dollars and actually step outside the fence line and seeing where we can actually build that last mile of trans or distribution line to give us an enhanced uh, redundancy or increased energy security um, uh, capability. So we've been given a lot by Congress, and now it's up to us to be able to use it as wisely as we possibly can. Um, and I, I think we have a, a lot of great uh, opportunities and initiatives underway that will allow us to do that. So um, I know Lucian has to be, can't, doesn't want to be in a position of advocating for more money, and, but I can advocate for more money for him. Um, I think that's one answer. Is that existing programs like ERSIP? I mean, it's $185 million now. Um, our maintenance backlog on our bases is $100 billion, GAO says. So when we're talking infrastructure, Go and look at a military base. They need roofs. They need energy systems. They, they need a lot. And so while I appreciate a $30 million plus up in energy resiliency um, project spending, um, th that pales in compar comparison to the demand. So one thing you can plus up existing programs. You really just should do that. If we're really going to serious about improving infrastructure on military bases, we've got to invest. The second thing is that we, it doesn't all have to be our money. Um, so leveraging third party financing whether it be from energy services companies or utilities who work with energy services companies, we've gotten a ton of value out of, uh, out of, out of our, our federal dollars by leveraging them with the private sector. And in fact, the, the private sector in many instances is just a better entity to do this stuff because they understand it better than we do. Um, uh, they're on the cutting edge more than we are. They can help us solve our problems. So leveraging them. And I think that 
as much as, as much a matter of funding as that's a matter a matter of focus. The department uh, should continue to work with uh, the private sector to figure out how to get these projects done and make them a priority because the threats are real and they're not going away. And uh, the only way we're going to mitigate them by, is by investing our own dollars and then working with the private sector to, to, to come up with some solutions. So funding and focus are, are two things I think that we should really uh, 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 think about. Terrific. Um, Senator, let me ask you, you you've been a, a staunch supporter of ARPA-E, um, our, our Energy Innovation Agency over the years, um, a, a, a really a staunch supporter of just energy innovation in general. What, what message would you send to your, to your colleagues um, you know, in Congress now on both sides of the aisle about the connection between the needs we're going to have for a resilient grid, a secure grid going forward, and the importance of continuing to fund a robust and a dynamic energy innovation and technology innovation ecosystem here in the United States? Well, well first of all, I, I, think, I think there's a strong bipartisan support for, for ARPA-E. And that's demonstrated by uh, there were proposed cuts to ARPA-E that the Congress rejected. Um, and really overrode on a bipartisan basis because they saw the value and I think there is an understanding that the reality is is that some research is not commercially viable and there's some issues that need to be solved quickly that will benefit the entire nation and I use storage as an example because storage is such a critical issue um, you know Senator Murkowski who's the chair of the Senate Energy Committee that if you think about the hearing she had in the last two weeks, uh, the last hearing she had was on Black Start, and then the hearing before that was on energy storage. And what are the challenges we face in really improving our energy storage, including you know issues, um, which I'm certainly not an expert in, on you know minerals and all the things that we need to. But the reality is, is that the technology has to continue to develop. And yes, some of that's happening in the private sector. And so anything we can do to incentivize that in the private sector, and I just add on the discussion we just had, um, you know, that as we think about these public-private partnerships, which I am all for, um, we also need to, I think, kind of ask the, the private sector, what are the barriers now to enhancing those public-private partnerships and make sure that if it's regulatory, the administration deals with it, or if it's, um, you know, in terms of the way the laws were written, we're sort of from years ago that don't match the way funding happens now, make sure we break down those barriers. But um, I, I kind of I feel pretty strongly that, that this is a bipartisan area, and I think also DARPA as well, and I think it will continue to be. Um, and, and obviously the focus of, I hope, ARPA-E continues to be on technologies that will benefit the nation as a whole and innovation that really can't happen in the private sector because it's just not commercially viable. Nicole, um, from your standpoint at Amoresco, you know, talking about public-private partnerships, and you know, you highlighted that's what you know made this Paris Island you know project so successful. Um, what more would you like to see? I mean, mm -hmm. is it just an example of something that's successful that could be scaled up, uh, or are there little calibrations or adjustments that could be made? To, you know, to enhance existing programs? Well, there, it's a well-established program, which is great. There's a lot of good examples out there of the use of this type of contract vehicle or financing structure. So the continued support, obviously from a headquarter, congressional level, is always you know, the great driver that we are able to get all these projects executed. Um, I think also, you know, we mentioned it earlier, time. I mean, it's always how can we get this done faster because some of these projects take what seems like forever to get accomplished. And I think it's a combination of resources and just the laws that we have I mean, just the process we have to go through. So anything that we can do to help support that um, would be great for us because we're spending a lot, investing a lot of money as well. And it could be money we invest in, pro in the project itself rather than just the time to go through the paperwork or the administrative side of it. And, and Joe, you've mentioned to me before um, a, a really interesting incident that you know uh, that that you observed uh, 
you know, during your time as, as Deputy Assistant Secretary at Incirlik Air Force Base in Turkey. Um, uh, tell us a little bit more about that and how that highlights a, a different sort of challenges when we have a military installation and a, a incredibly strategic and important military operation going on, which was reliant not on our own grid infrastructure, but the grid infrastructure of a third party country. Uh, sure, David. I did not observe happenings in Interlick. I did read about them, though. I, <laughs> I wasn't. I was not in Turkey. Is that, an that wasn't me. It was a doppelganger. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a. It, the question has been uh, quite a bit as to what it's what it's going to take to get us to focus on this problem. Is it going to take an attack by an adversary on the grid that shuts down a critical uh, capability? critical military capability that gets us all the focus on solving this, right? And that gets everybody pulling in the same direction. Um, and the, the example that I've, I've cited to Dave is, in some cases, we've already had this incident, right? Uh, Inserlik Air Base in July of, of 2016, it's a critical air base. We do a lot of our anti-ISIS uh, operations out of there. Uh, during the coup in Turkey in, in, in the summer of 2016, Turks shut off power to Inserlik. And so what Interlick did is they moved to their backup generators, which is fine. They were able to continue for some time, but it got pretty dicey, and they did have to curtail some things that they were doing. Uh, power was off for a week. Um, I think it was turned on. And look, the, the President of the United States was commenting on it. Secretary of Defense was commenting on it, how critical this is to our national security interests in the region. And that was energy in Turkey at a base for a week. And that mission, strategic missions there and tactical missions, uh, vulnerable. And we got a lot of important bases here in the United States and around the world that carry with them the same vulnerabilities. So when people ask, do we need an incident, uh, a big disaster to, to get us to focus on this, in some cases we have incidents that have happened that we should be paying attention to and thinking about, okay, what does that mean for the rest of our bases and the rest of our, our missions? So that's, that, that, that's something I think we could all learn from, and, and I'm not sure we've internalized uh, the, the lessons there. I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of thinking on, on the, in the department on that front. And, uh, yeah, we have, we have spent a lot of time on it, and, and uh, Lisa will attest it. We've made some radical changes to our policies within the last uh, 18 months that the, it's shaken up the entire industry. We are laser-focused on energy security for our critical installations. I mean, that is where we're putting our effort. Uh, we're not chasing the deals because it does have to be a certain uh, cost per kilowatt hour that makes it, you know, makes it attractive. We are actually going after where our most critical vulnerabilities are and hitting them with proactive solutions. And we're using every possible authority we have, uh, ESPCs, USCs, PPAs, uh, uh, utilities privatization where it works, and then flat out investments and in, in appropriated dollars. So I wouldn't necessarily say we need an event uh, to wake us up. We are definitely uh, woke. We're, we're, we understand what's going on, and we're working every day right now uh, on, on real solutions as opposed to trying to, to continue to admire the problem. And I just want to say, Lucian, I, I know that, you, I know that uh, just to be clear, there's a, a core group of people who are paying attention to this every day and spending their, li it's their life's work, right? It's just we need more. Now, as we think about this discussion, let's also not forget the other three-letter agencies that are very important to our nation and what could be done there. So... Yeah, I mean, DOD, but also many of your partners. It's absolutely, I mean, when, when we're talking about partnering with DOE, uh, DHS is right there uh, with us on determining, okay, where do we have critical infrastructure that's outside our gates that ultimately feeds the military mission? You know, folks don't realize it might be that water plant or it might be that local power plant or that may be the local substation that's off the base that's absolutely critical to the installation. But I was also thinking of perhaps some of our intelligence agencies mm -hmm. as well when it comes to our security. Well, we've got a great group assembled here as well, um, here in the audience. So, so why don't we make sure to get some questions from the audience? I'm sure there are a lot. It's a very timely topic. Um, I'm going to go around and collect a few questions at a time. Uh, when you do um, ask a question, please make sure uh, to state your name and affiliation uh, at the outset. Um, and as just a gentle reminder, uh, every good question, uh, the first sentence ends with a question mark and there is no second sentence. Uh, so yes, sir, we've got a first question uh, right up here and we'll have a microphone coming around. So just wait one moment while the microphone gets to you to make sure we get that uh, 
catch that question. Uh, yes, a very good panel discussion. Jack Werner, Climate Institute, former state government energy official. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about resilience, security, safety in the grid. Uh, there was a big conference held in GW a month or about a year ago, an article in the New York Times talking about high voltage direct current transmission grid overlay. So doing a high voltage direct current transmission you know, a system, and I was just wondering if any of the panelists have looked at that and been, you know, been taking a, a thought about how we could start getting that started here in the U.S. China's doing it, being done in Europe, uh, and it's something that really needs to be looked upon because it addresses all of these issues. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, another question right up here. Thank you. <clears throat> Great discussion. Uh, Deborah Kagan, National Defense University. Um, impact of cryptocurrencies on draining the grid. And you, we've talked about external threats. You've talked about the effect of storms, wildfires, et cetera. What about the drain of cryptocurrencies? Great. And let's get one more question uh, from over here. Uh, this gentleman right, right here. Um, and then we'll go around for a second round of three right after this. Thanks. I'm Elliot Roseman with the United States Energy Association. In the um, discussion, I haven't heard any mention of collaboration with utilities, with FERC, with uh, other entities that are already dealing with a lot of these issues. As you know, I'm sure there have been standards in place uh, that uh, SIP standards for a long time since the Energy Policy Act of 2005. What are you doing or what are the opportunities for the defense uh, establishment to collaborate with what's already being done in response to the storms and the fires, et cetera, on the, uh, uh, out there by the commercial energy sector, utilities, RTOs, FERC, et cetera. Great. So we've got three questions. One on uh, high voltage direct current overlay on the grid, uh, similar to what, what China or the European Union might be uh, considering and deploying. Second one is um, the energy use of, of uh, distributed ledger technologies, uh, uh, cryptocurrency mining, or any other large kind of um, uh, uh, vampiric sort of demand on the grid. Uh, and then third one having to do with collaboration with FERC, utilities, RTOs, et cetera. Um, Lucian, do you want to take that, take that one first, uh, that last one? So that's an outstanding question. And yeah, we've uh, spent a lot of time with just about every major CEO of, of a utility company from around the country in one-on-one -on -one meetings and with, uh, with uh, some of the military departments. Um, the, the first place where we're partnering with utilities is down at the installation level. We have a requirement to making sure that at, that installation energy manager uh, where they see a critical function. They are, first thing they're doing is they're partnering with the local utility to see, okay, how can we come up with comprehensive plans with the utility on addressing the vulnerability? That's really where the rubber meets the road for us at the installation level. We at OSD can put out every policy letter we want. We can meet with the CEOs, but it, the real solutions are going to lie in the field, and that is happening. Now, the, the key is what direction do you give the field? And that's something that we have made changes to in the last uh, uh, 15 months as far as in the past, these installation energy master plans focused on efficiencies, focused on where we could you know, generate uh, renewable energy or where we could you know, pursue certain goals. We have now updated that guidance to say, our, our energy manager, you need to work on how do you power your critical facilities? Where do you need to put a micro grid in? Where do you need storage as opposed to generators? Unfortunately, generators you know, are 1980s technology. We need to come up with new ways to be able to provide sustained backup power, not, n not knowing where we're going to get our next resupply of diesel fuel. That really starts at the installation level. And the first thing that ins installation is doing around the country is partnering up locally with the local utility to say, okay, where can you give us assistance? Where's your expertise? That's kind of where we're seeing it gen up from there. Um, in terms of, you know, beyond the military facilities also, um, I think with the utilities, there are some significant resource challenges there depending on what happens. I mean, a lot of the local, PU you know, the state PUCs, uh, with rate making uh, will decide how much is going to be invested in infrastructure. And so as I think about things like cyber also, um, there are many of the things that we're asking utilities to do that I understand are voluntary. And so, you know, some may adopt, some may not adopt, and that's a very difficult position to be in when it comes to a, th a cyber type threat. So I, it, and then I just wanted to add that FERC has opened up a docket on resilience um, and as I understand it, not a lot has happened yet with that docket, but it would be an opportunity really for FERC to take up some of these issues and to hear from the utilities 
to hear to hear from other interested players about what we should be doing um, from the regulatory spec perspective uh, when it comes to some of these resiliency issues. So I don't know. We'll stay tuned to what FERC does. I would just add to that too the other import from a private perspective, the role of the utility uh, in bringing funding to these projects. Uh, there are utilities and ISOs that are offering incentives for storage or for on-site generation to help. I mean, they're getting a benefit as well, you know, for grid stability. So that's important to us in finding other funding streams to make these projects cash flow from the initial onset. So I'm hoping that we see an increase in that in some of the other utilities. And right now you see that in New York is a good example, um, even in Massachusetts. And, you know, I know in California is another great example, too. So that will continue to help get more of these projects online as well. Nicole, you just keyed on the key point there, and that is uh, um, as far as the role of the local utility companies, uh, we are also, uh, um, my office is also responsible for reviewing where we have excess capacity, and I don't know if you all have heard the term BRAC, uh, based for alignment closures. <laughs> um, so when you talk to communities around the country and states, they ask us, okay, what are you looking for for the military value of your future installations? When we start coming back and we're saying energy security and energy reliability, they start paying attention. States and communities start saying, okay, what can we do working with utilities to improve the energy resiliency? Because they, be they rightfully believe that is how we're going to judge military value in the future. It goes back to what I said in the beginning. Our bases are going to become more reliant on electricity for weapon systems and for operations. Therefore, moving forward, we are telling communities around the country, energy security will become a primary military value factor. Now is the time to start partnering with the states, with the local utilities and, lo and, and local ESCOs and um, uh, installations. How do we build uh, energy resilience and security in the future installations? And it's a very powerful message that's resonating right now. Well, one thing I also wanted to add on the utility context, I think it's really interesting that the utilities are also partnering with some of these innovative technologies, like for example, Bloom, the company that I serve on, has a partnership with Southern Company now, and that's a relatively new partnership. So I think you'll also see um, the utilities really looking at these new technologies, too, and embracing them where it makes sense with their business model. Yeah, finally, I would say on the utility front, um, look, uh, Nicole's company and companies like her execute through uh, their utility partners in a lot of places on our basis. So utility energy services contracts or how we get a lot of things done on military bases. And so there's a lot of alignment with our uh, people who actually do the projects and our utilities who are uh, who service the bases. And, and Senator Ayotte's right. I mean, there's a lot of great research being done in the utility industry. I, I do some work with the Electric Power Research Institute, um, do a lot of technology scouting. And a lot of these uh, uh, technologies that are coming to market are, are, are coming to market through uh, tests and and, and, and trials that are being done in the utility sector. So um, they're a good partner on this stuff. Before we move to another round of questions on, on, um, on any of those other questions, any thoughts about um, particular maybe competing uh, large, quickly uh, growing sources of energy demand? Could you envision some sort of ramping or control of uh, you know, non-critical energy demand sources like cryptocurrency? No, no, the cryptocurrency question put me in stun mode because I don't necessarily have a, I mean, to me, it's such, an, it's such a dynamic market right now. And as you know, it could go all over the place. Uh, I, I do believe that's just endemic of where we're going with the society is this increased automation, increased use of like reliance on electricity. You know, we're, we're moving away from combustion. We're moving more towards electricity-based uh, technologies across the board. Um, and to what degree that just increases our need for reliable power, I, I don't know if one particular industry is going gonna, is gonna to outweigh another as far as um, emphasizing the need for just more reliable power. Um, so I look at electric vehicles as just as much of a future demand increase as, as, in, as any other emerging technology. Right. One thing that I, I'll just note on that, um, as, as someone who's kind of casually observing the um, both the, the role of uh, distributed ledger technologies in the energy sector, as well as the energy demand of those technologies, it's it's worth taking a look at what happened in Quebec, where the that province quickly went from a um, uh, a situation of trying to attract investment and trying to at attract uh, cryptocurrency mining and, and distributed ledger technology uh, activity within the province uh, for their hydro load um, to, to quickly backing off that and trying to potentially, um, you know, create some, some caveats or some different market structures that control the energy demand coming from those activities. Worth taking a look at. 
All right, why don't we take a, a, another round of questions real quick. Um, gentlemen right there, uh, and then um, why don't we come uh, over to Bob Icord in the middle there, and then we'll come to the front and then take one more round after that. Hi, I'm, I'm James Jackson with the Clean Energy Business Network. I serve as the board chair. But during my day job, uh, we develop as a small company uh, some unique technology for uh, geothermal power, which back in 2016 there was a report that uh, showed that over 40 percent of our nation's uh, military bases have geothermal power underneath the bases. And so as a small company, you guys brought up a, a great point about the long sales cycle. So uh, anything you could do and, and mention anything you can address for a small company to try to weather that long sales cycle to match those those kind of innovative solutions with the right uh, uh, ESCO or maybe the right contract vehicle, Any, anything that you could suggest uh, would, be, would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, question right here in the middle. Just pass the mic down the aisle. Thank you all. Bob Eichert from the Atlantic Council. Um, we're working in the Atlantic Council on, on the U.S. nuclear leadership, and there's a lot of interest in Congress on this issue. Um, and Lucian, I, I saw that you released the uh, roadmap for micro reactor development, and I'd be interested in your comments more on that. Um, why 2027, if new scale is going to go into op commercial operation in 23 or something like that? Because it seems to me that the report indicates 90% of your ba installations need 30 to 50 megawatts of power. So it seems to me that that might be ideally if the, if the cost and the commercialization can, can occur, and hopefully you can do it before 2027. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on it. Great. And then, Bob, could you just pass that microphone right up here uh, to the front? Yeah. Yep. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Could you tell us more about what you're doing in storage? Great. Terrific. So we've got three technology questions. Uh, one which touched on geothermal uh, and, and, and the role of, you know, um, what we can do with this long sales cycle uh, on military bases for energy solutions providers. I should mention I'm the, the son of someone who grew up on uh, China Lake uh, Naval Base out in the desert, which has one of the most successful instances of geothermal being used at a military installation. Another question on nuclear microreactors uh, and the recent DOD report on, on this and their role in it. Uh, and then uh, and then finally, energy storage. Uh, I guess I got all three. Please. <laughs> all right, I'll start with uh, the first one first. Um, th there's no doubt we have a lot of untapped potential for geothermal. Uh, uh, I can only ask you to bring bring the, the ideas that you have uh, to that local installation. Um, they are their doors are open. Uh, we are looking for all sources of generation, and, and 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 we look at them equally. What's the most effective way to provide power for that base? We're not emphasizing one source over the other. I mean, I'll, I'll take nuclear, geothermal, gas, you know, anything. I'll take gerbils if it if it works. Yeah, for for if we can figure out a way to business model to work. Bottom line is is that we need to ha have an aggressive approach by the private sector coming to that installation, saying, look, we've got a solution that works for you. If 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 it if the business model plays out quickly, it 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 should because of the urgency we've now imparted to the middle departments, it should raise up and actually turn into some type of proactive action relatively quickly. Um, you can't wait for a cessation to go out. I think you need to basically come in and talk to uh, starting installation. If not, there, then come to D.C. and talk to the military department. So I really, I do believe that we are getting to a point where we see something that, that it's a home run, that we're going to move quickly. We have the ability to move quickly with new authorities to go ahead and put that into action. Uh, there was a second question, and it was on uh, micro on the, on the report. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Great question. Uh, there are technologies out there. I'm not going to name a manufacturer or a company, but there are technologies out there that we're very interested in. We're actually looking more at the 3 to 5 to 15 meg range. Um, uh, when we get above 15, and if you actually, if you look at that one you mentioned, is actually they are looking at maybe 200 being being economical. Um, that starts to that starts to um, capacity us out of the market because we're looking for individual insulation uh, 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 energy solutions. So that's why we're looking about the 25 meg range. Um, uh, for the installations we're looking at, right now we are keying in on and key strategic ins installations that uh, are in remote locations that power unbelievably critical missions. Uh, we're looking at a solution that would allow us to take the, that particular installation completely off the grid and run it. 
Um, if you all know what happened at Fort Greeley for years, we actually had a nuclear reactor up at Fort Greeley. We decommissioned a few years ago. But that was the right location to have some type of dedicated power source. Um, so we're looking at all types of technology. Uh, 2027, uh, we are trying to hedge ourselves a little bit, a little conservative, uh, because if you look at some of the technology, they will require licensing by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, there are other ones out there that might you know, be able that we might be able to move quickly with. Um, so we do believe that 2027 is a conservative date, but we've also announced internal goals for certain types of technology that we could get it done quicker at certain locations. And there was the third question, which Storage. I forget now. Storage. It's the holy grail, as you know. I mean, a, a, and we definitely would love uh, to continue to see what's out there in the market. Uh, we cannot continue to rely on generators with diesel backup that only provides a 24-hour backup power. But you can't do storage without um, distribution or, or microgrid or smart grid distribution. You can't power the entire base. So storage by itself is not going to be a solution unless we're doing it for individual facilities. And as you know, we have, you know, um, ups, but it only gives us maybe an hour of, of you know, of, and it's more used as a, as a transfer process. Um, so, yes, that is something that uh, we continue to invest in. It is the sole focus of our, RD, our research funds for 2019. We realize how important it is. And it's not just important for installations, but it's important for the uh, uh, warfighter on the battlefield. Um, that future warfighter is going to carry some type of shoulder-borne laser. That laser is going to need some type of power pack that doesn't even exist today. So we, that's something that we are aware of. We know that's what the National Defense Strategy is calling for. And there's a lot of folks, not just in my area, but also in research and engineering, the new undersecretary we've stood up, who are really focusing on what we can do that's, um, uh, as of today, unheard of as far as not just energy storage, but pulse and quick recharge. Th that's, an, that's a big part of this, is how quickly you can you recharge that storage once you've depleted it. I'd, I'd love to hear uh, Nicole's take on the storage question, because I think they've got a lot, her company's got a lot of experience on that. But I will say this, the uh, price of renewables, uh, dropping like a rock um, we'll take the, whatever. the price of storage uh, also dropping aggressively I think there's opportunities now and there's going to be increasing opportunities on base in the future for storage and not just storage but smart storage that you can respond to market conditions on the on the uh, 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 on the markets and uh, also respond to resiliency needs should the grid go down so there is an economic opportunity now for storage on our installations and there will be a bigger opportunity, a growing opportunity tomorrow because the, the, the prices are all coming our way. So I, I would, um, my interest would be in pushing the storage and less on the, less on the, uh, on the, on the modular nuclear reactors, but that's, that's a, that's a personal, uh, thing of mine. At, we are seeing storage on about every one of our projects right now for, for large facilities, not just for the Department of Defense, but also for colleges, universities, um, hospitals, because it is provides such a, again, just the speed of what it can, it can do compared to a traditional diesel generator, and then compared to the, the ongoing maintenance requirements of a battery versus a diesel generator as well. So there's a big space that it can play there, and the cost is a lot more competitive now than what it used to be. So it's a, it's a very good alternative to diesel generation as a backup source. Uh, we're also seeing batteries used not just for energy security, but just for reduction in utility rates. And just in states where there's higher demand rates, um, it's a great way to, to mitigate some of that. So there's economic benefits. Uh, and then just being, again, remote sites. Um, we're working on a site in Puerto Rico right now where they're, you know, obviously they've had major issues with their grid stability, but just so they have their own source of power and don't have to depend on the grid anymore. Um, so that's another where we're seeing it, and I think that's going to be the trend to keep going. Great, thank you. Um, and Lucian, I should mention, I'm excited to see the first uh, the first gerbil plus storage project <laughs> that you guys roll out. I know that's coming down the pike soon. I got to get past Peter right now, but <laughs> we're, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we take a, a, a third round of questions. Let's start over on this side, if we can. Um, swing the microphone around here. Uh, gentleman right here, a uh, lady in back of him, and then we'll come around the back. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, rather. Uh, my question is actually geared more towards Lucian, but I'm sure everyone's going to kind of chime in. My name is Steve Picciarella. I'm with the USDA Rural Utility Service Electric Program. I'm an advisor with them. And 
what we've been noticing uh, specifically is a lot of our independently owned utility borrowers, the cooperatives, and the municipal utilities, they're asking exactly this. We want to keep our national defense assets safe, secure, and supplied. Um, now, with the new, what I get, so that's what I'm saying. Also, with the new USDA farm bill language, it's specifically stating language now that we're not just focusing on offering loans to any of anyone regarding energy, but specifically they want to make sure that the language states grid security and grid resilience. I guess what I'm trying to say is from that whole government approach, um, I'm not sure if you guys know too much about us, but our portfolio is $200 billion. Um, we we loan it Fed plus an eighth, and it invo involves the communities and it splits the risk between communities and the federal government. Is there thought of that? I mean, is there any thought of just embracing not just uh, not just private sector, but also govern uh, other government assets? It's a terrific question. Thank you. Uh, next one, Lady Rick. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Butenko. I'm a senior fellow at Vermont Law School and also a Transatlantic Technology Law Forum fellow at Stanford. Uh, my question has two parts, two aspects, and one of them is a European one because I wanted to bring a little bit of an international perspective because I recently moved from the Netherlands. And second one is the focus on consumers because we have talked about the effects of distributed energy generation for the resilience of the grid and we have talked about the government role and we have talked about the utilities and the business role. What I feel that we haven't talked about today is the role of the final energy consumers who have a rather crucial role, in my opinion, in installing the distributed energy generation and storage uh, solutions in their houses in a more distributed way. Now, what's happening in Europe is that the fourth energy package, which was proposed in 2016, is entrusting, in fact, energy consumers with a very big role. So the idea behind it is that by empowering the final consumer, we put on them a part of responsibility for our energy future and for the resilience of the grid. My question, based on this background, is as follows. What do you think is the role of the energy consumer here, and how can we make sure that they do, in fact, assume this responsibility and act upon it, other than being incentivized by uh, financial incentives? Thank you. Great question. And do we have uh, any more over in this uh, side of the room? Great. With that, why don't we just take uh, or go to that one real quick, collect a third question, and then we'll uh, answer all three of those. Hi. My name is Nathan Getty. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Niemeyer, you briefly mentioned electric vehicles. Uh, I'd love to understand a little bit more about how Congress is budgeting. Uh, DOD is working with the transportation logistics side to, to manage military fleets in the future. Thank you. Great. Three terrific questions. Who wants to take, uh, take one of those first? <laughs> I could take the last one first. Sure, sure. So as far as uh, the, we're watching what's happening in society, I mean, you, you see as 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 edu energy storage requirements or, or technology emerges, particularly for uh, for commercial vehicles, um, it, it becomes more prevalent, and we're getting to the point where performances that matter near uh, are near matching uh, uh, combustion engines. Uh, we're going to just see that the society is going to adapt it, and we're going to have to go ahead and and, and respond. Uh, there have been some investments over the last few years on in DOD installations to ensure we've got charging stations, and we continue to work that. Uh, it, it's really more just realizing where where we are going overall, and to making sure that DoD has the resources available on base and off base to be able to meet um, what is an emerging you know emerging trend. So I wouldn't say that we're putting any any uh, special money into it. Um, uh, uh, we're probably I would say we're investing at the level that you're seeing happening in the private sector for electric charging stations. Please, Senator. Go I ahead. was just going to um, take the consumer question in this sense. I mean, if you look at the last several years in the Congress, um, for example, there was a bipartisan energy bill that was passed. Um, within that, for example, I had a provision that was bipartisan on, um, for example, commercial buildings, even a tenant star type program beyond just the consumer energy star type programs. And then even if you look at what the Congress has recently done um, with the energy and water bill, uh, there was renewed funding that really goes down to the state level, uh, focused on renewables and energy efficiency programs. 
And so we have had a variety of programs really incentivizing energy efficiency on the economic front for the consumers. But I think you've asked a broader question, which is not just the economic incentives that whether we can do it through tax credits or some other way on energy efficiency, um, but also, you know, what's the general consumer's attitude toward this? And um, I'm the mother of an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old, and it's really fascinating to me to see that I think their focus on issues like energy and the intersection with the environment is much more, um, much more than I was certainly at this, their age. But the reality is for the consumer is it's still going to be, can I charge my iPhone? And so I don't think we can rely on just all of a sudden, you know, everyone's going to do this because it's the good and right thing to do. I think we have to continue to develop technology that drives down cost and makes it sensible for consumers to want to adopt this technology. Uh, and that's, you know, so that, that's how I see the consumer role. And there are a number of things happening at the state level. Different states have different programs of how they're incentivizing efficiency, how they're educating their population, how they're um, dealing with issues on adoption of renewables. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of tax provisions on the federal level that, for example, um, you know, incentivize solar or wind or, or other type technologies. But in the long term, it's really going to be about the market driving down costs and providing, I think, um, providing the best technology and availability that's going to want the consumer to adopt it. Yeah, I, I was actually going to go in a little bit different direction with that answer, and that is there's no doubt that uh, individual consumer actions have a role to play. But if we're talking about grid resiliency, my, my concern is sometimes we have a tendency to focus in on what we think ultimately be good for the environment as opposed to, okay, do you really want your light still to be on tomorrow? And I, and, and, and I think we, in, the, in, in not just here, but around the world, we've spent a lot of time on ensuring that we have uh, generation sources that we, can, that we feel comfortable with, that we feel are, are doing the right thing. And we're not spending enough time on making sure that regardless of what happens, what generation source we have, uh, we're willing to pay that a little extra to ensure that we have that reliable power that we just expect every day. No one's really really thinking about what do we need to spend today extra in your rates. Everybody, everybody sees their electric bill. They say, hey, if I pay an extra 15 cents or, or, you know, a, or a month, or if I spend an extra cent and a half per kilowatt hour, I can make sure my power is coming from re re renewable sources. Okay, Fan great if that's, if that's a consumer choice you want to make. I like to spend an extra cent and a half per kilowatt hour to make sure that someone could assure me I'm going to have 99.9% .9 reliable power. Um, and so I think we need to make sure that we're balanced here of, of ultimately serving a couple of different uh, needs um, that we are concerned about, which is sustainable as well as reliable and secure. And I'm kind of these days, because I'm working in DoD, I'm more worried about the secure part than anything else right now. Nicole, um, are those two necessarily even in opposition? Can we, can we no, have I sustainable think those are and secure? Very good points, and I think tying them together is just an awareness. And I think you know, using the technology that's out there, we have smart thermostats now. You can you know, get your kids on their iPhones, and they can see how energy is being used. And just you know, that power to be able to control um, your energy usage or your, you know, it can sense when you're coming home now. And there's so many different things that are out there to help consumers be part of this uh, energy reduction. And there's demand response programs that the utilities offer so to, uh, to help against this peak hit on the utilities or when all the uh, sun goes down in Hawaii. I mean, they, they see it. I mean, that's a, a major problem there, problem there right now. So they are working with their consumers to try to reduce that peak power during that window of time. So I think, again, awareness and just you know, tying in that technology would go a long way. So. Couple, just a couple of comments. One, I think I think price and sustainability are coming into alignment, right? If you look out on the forward on the curve, the cheapest asset, the cheapest resources coming into the market are renewables in a lot of places, right? In a lot of cases, wind, uh, solar, uh, very very competitive and outcompeting natural gas in uh, in a lot of future scenarios. So I think alignment between price and uh, and uh, and sustainability is happening already, um, and. I, I would uh, tend to agree with Lucian that, you know, people are going to be driven by price no matter what. It's, it's, it's always hard to do the right thing when it costs you more. Um, so it's a good thing that those things are, are coming into alignment. On, and then I would just comment on the electric vehicles. We had, a, we had a pretty aggressive program when I was at the Department of Navy on deploying electric vehicles, particularly in California. Um, and uh, I think that 
we're probably a little bit behind the curve in the Department of, of Defense on terms of our uh, adoption of electric vehicles. In some cases, not through, not certainly not through Lucian's fault or anything, but this is a, it's an infrastructure issue to a certain extent, right? Is you can get the cars, you still have to put in the infrastructure. And I think we're gonna have to begin to think about how we're gonna transition to electric vehicles on military installations for our fleets and even for the people who come onto our installations. And we're gonna have to work with, with the private sector who's doing a lot of, of our other energy infrastructure work to build that in because uh, we don't have uh, uh, millions and millions of dollars to uh, outfit our fleets with, uh, with charging infrastructure, but we're, we're gonna need to have it. It's just, that's just reality. That's a, that's a really apt note to end on um, and, and a good reminder that this is less a conversation, uh, less a, a issue area that is about debates between individual technologies and about how do, we, how do we get a variety of different technologies to work well together in a sustainable and secure way within a complex system. Um, this is the first, but surely not the last, uh, in, in, a, in a dynamic dialogue with leading thinkers and, and, and leading figures in this space on the future of a, of a resilient and secure grid and the role that advanced energy plays in that secure, sustainable, and resilient grid in the future. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being a part of this. And please join me in thanking our illustrious panel for their contributions today as well. Never accused of being, uh, I've never been accused of being uh, uh,